I'm delighted to be here this afternoon for this discussion with the uh, outgoing chair of UACES, um, Professor Helen Drake, and with Adam Steinhaus. Um, I'm Nick Starting, I'm the chair elect of UACES and head of department for politics, languages and international studies at the University of Bath. Helen, the outgoing chair, is the is a professor of French and European studies at Loughborough University and she is the uh, director of the Institute of Diplomacy and International Governance, which is based at their London campus. And Adam is a long-standing member of UACES uh, with a long, rich tradition of teaching both students and government officials about the complexities of the European Union. Um, I'll start with the first question then, if that's okay. Helen, um, why did you decide to become an academic? And could you tell us a bit more about your route from uh, undergraduate student to where you are today as professor and Chair of UACs. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. I became an academic in very different times and I was I was lucky. I had I had a lot of luck and I, I look as I look back I realised that some of the lucky breaks I had probably aren't around today. Um, so I, I suppose again looking back I sort of did the right things. I, I got my degree in um, French and European studies and international relations at Surrey. Uh, I then went and worked in France for a bit and then I came back to the UK and did a Masters uh, in European Management actually at uh, Cranfield and and then really I fell into being an academic, I stumbled into being an academic. I was looking for jobs and I ended up at Aston University in Birmingham and but I'd applied for an, admi an administrative position because I suppose at that point, nobody, I hadn't really thought of myself as academic material. I hadn't been in an environment where that was an automatic route, really, from either master's or bachelor level. Uh, so I went to Aston University and I, I was involved in running uh, student exchanges. And then I remember one day I was in my office and two professors sidled in and shut the door behind them and said, um, Helen, we think, we, we think you should apply for a lectureship. Uh, and they effectively sort of stood over me while I while I filled out the application form. And at that time, the vice chancellor of Aston University was very, um, uh, how can we put it, very sort of clear that he wanted, um, yeah, he 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 wanted to recruit people uh, as academics to lectureships who had a good track record in academia. And I was, as I said, I, so I had sort of done the right things, um, and and who then would be prepared to take a PhD as a staff candidate. So I applied. The, the professors left the, left my office. Um, I applied, <laughs> and I was successful. Uh, and at that time as well, the the vice chancellor of Aston conducted every single academic interview himself uh, mm. with, with, with with colleagues. But he, mm. he was there, and I'm fairly certain that the chair that the candidate was on was was substantially lower than the chair of the interviewers. But I still <laughs> I managed to get the job. Uh, and for I think for six months or a year, I, I actually did both. I was still doing the exchanges and 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 the sort of starting off as a, a lecturer. I registered for a, a part time candidate. Uh, sorry, a part time PhD as a staff candidate. One of my colleagues, John Gaffney, was my uh, supervisor, and and that's how it started. I think I must have had a lot more energy then, and probably the job was different because I did manage to combine. Um, studying for the PhD, starting a few publications, started with book reviews, for example, and then uh, and, and teaching uh, uh, as well as enjoying Birmingham. So that was really how I started. Um, and then at that time, as I say, Aston put everybody on three year fixed term contracts. Um, I got the first, I got renewed once. So it was in the second three years that surprise, surprise, me and most of my colleagues looked for permanent positions elsewhere. Um, and I, the job at Loughborough came up and I started at Loughborough on the 1st of January 1996 and uh, I've been able to build my career at Loughborough and only last year, so exactly really a year ago, did I uh, make the move from Loughborough, Loughborough, the Midlands campus, some of my colleagues call it the Northern campus, <laughs> but we know it's in the Midlands, I made the move from there down to the, uh, the exclusively postgraduate campus, which as both of you know, is on the Olympic Park in uh, in London, in East London, and that's where I am now. So that that's the short version. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think I first came across your work 
when I saw your Routledge published book on Jacques Delors, which I think came out in 2000. That's correct, right. yeah. yeah. Um, obviously Jacques Delors then being the uh, two-term president of the European Commission. Um, I guess things back then seemed a lot more optimistic around yeah. you know, the future of the European Union. And I just wondered what you thought Jacques Delors' legacy might be in terms of his contribution to the European project. Yeah, I, I mean, Jacques Delors back then, um, as she said, was commission president. And he is actually, in a way, the reason that I started the PhD or that I did the PhD I did, which, so that was effectively a book from my PhD work. Because on the 1st of November 1990, there was the infamous Sun headline, um, <laughs> Up Yours Delors with the Two Fingers. And this was because, oh, this was in reference to Delors' role in setting up the single currency. So, in, in policy terms, I think he will be forever associated with policies including, but not only, the single, cu- the single currency, um, mm. enlargement of the EU as well, um, and I think, and, I th- and the single market, of course, the, the single market that now, uh, only today, the British government is uh, uh, holed up trying to uh, discuss in terms of its future relationship. Mm. So I think... I think I would summarise his legacy in saying that almost certainly his his most um, uh, public legacy will be policies that today have probably come under, are coming under a lot of fire, uh, a lot of criticism, perhaps not so much the single market, but certainly the, the, the single currency. Um, but I would also say that his legacy in terms of him as a leader, his leadership skills, I think they stand the test of time. The way that he ran his team, the way that he interacted with the member states, his his style of leadership. Um, he was almost a leader despite himself, um, and he turned out to be rather good at it in those circumstances. So, yeah, that's he'll have a policy legacy, but also for those who are interested to look behind that, a legacy as what can be done from a leadership position um, at the European Commission. Do you think he would have a regret about the fact that maybe the social Europe dynamic that seemed to be much more alive in the yeah. 90s didn't become a, a major priority? For the I'm, I'm almost certain that's the case. I think he'll, mm. uh, he's stopped pronouncing, you've probably noticed, he is still alive. Uh, he stopped pronouncing some time ago, so a couple of years back, I think. Um, I think he has regrets about the single currency. He will say... I told them that the Eurozone had to walk on uh, on its two legs. You know, we ha- you, you can't have financial monetary convergence without economic convergence. You know, that, that, that he would probably regret that he wasn't able to persuade, especially Germany, perhaps France and Germany, to be bolder in how they converge their economies and so on. Uh, and, and definitely over, the, over social Europe. Um, but we, perhaps we will know, perhaps we won't. Uh, the other thing I remember being very impressed about with you was in 2010 <laughs> yes. that you were awarded this uh, wonderful honour um, by the French government for your services to French culture and language. If I remember right, I'm going to read off my notes here. The Chevalier dans l'ordre des Palmes académiques. How did, that, how did all that come about? Um, well, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, the Chevalier is, I discovered sort of afterwards, it's the junior award in the uh, Palme Académique. There's three levels. Um, and I was, re- again, I, w- I suppose I was fortunate. I was serving at that point on the Franco-British Council, um, which was set up at the time of the Heath um, and Pompidou governments in Britain and France, respectively, in 1973, to foster friendship between the two countries. It it still exists now, but a lot of its funding has been cut, actually, from the two respective foreign offices. Um, and I, I served, on, I served on, on, on that council, and it was during uh, my time there that one of my um, one of my fellow council members, Anne Corbett, a journalist who I think you both know, um, I think from memory she 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 nominated me, and it was for for the for the for my research, but also for the sort of the the teaching that by then I'd done on on France and and on the French language. And the thing I'd like to perhaps sort of come back to is when the award was made um, at the uh, French Institute, I was. I mean, I was the only, I think, non-scientist there. There was a zoologist. There was uh, there were people from from all 
all disciplines and all sort of walks of life who who had contributed to Franco-British friendship in their way. One small sort of, I, I think, quite funny sort of aspect of this is, um, so I got the award, it's like a lapel uh, a lapel little sort of pin um, and then months 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 later I got a letter which I've still got in my office frame saying that the Queen has now granted me permission to wear my lapel badge uh, which I thought was a nice interesting sort of reflection on the the the, the, the kind of the the idea of an honour and so on I, yes um, I, I had been wearing it before the Queen gave me permission well, Helen, as you've just been describing, you're obviously a leading expert in the study of France. So what I think both Nick and I are interested in, how did you then find it useful to go from the study of one country to the study of the EU as a whole? Hmm. Well, I think um, France is not just any... From the perspective <laughs> of the EU, I suppose France is not just any country. <laughs> um, it was one of the founder member states and I think actually the way that I got sort of from looking at France to looking at to, to being interested in the EU was almost through the Franco-British relationship um, mm -hmm. in that France and Britain are so close are such allies such friends and so on and yet on the EU certainly at the le level of their language how they talk about it they seem to have quite diametrically opposed ideas and yet on the ground there are many joint um, uh, shared preferences for defence and security and so on. So in France, um, I was intrigued and I'm still intrigued. I still haven't really cracked at this idea of having a political Europe. And I've started to ask French people, academic, not, 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 not anybody, but sort of academics, well, what do you mean by political Europe? And they say, oh, I'm not, not really sure, but, you know, we know what it is. And, and they mean, it, it, they refer to the institutions and the idea that, that Europe, ha they don't necessarily mean that Europe's federal but that it has some sort of presence in the world, that it has a set of distinct values and so on. Um, and I think that's that's an area where France and Britain find it hard to talk to each other. Um, so I think that's how I got from studying France to perhaps to studying the European Union. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit more about what then the EU or Europe means to you? Hmm. Again, I... I in some ways, studying whether it's France or Europe as a Brit seems a bit parochial. You know, I'm so impressed by my students who come from all over the world, um, mm. say in my current institute, and they don't want a Eurocentric mm. education or approach and so on. So I, I but for, for me at the time, I suppose, looking back, it did feel quite exotic uh, <laughs> to go from uh, being a, a grammar school kid at, in Hertfordshire to making the first sort of trips to France and then mm. learning the language and being able to to, 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 to live in, in France and amongst French. So it, um, I suppose the, pro the proximity uh, drew me to it. And then, and I, and then, yes, I still do think that what has been built amongst EU member states, EU countries, the, 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 the links, the ties, the friendship, it is extraordinary. And I was drawn. I was drawn to that. And I, I think also my my studies of Delors at PhD level and my ongoing interest in in leadership, um, mm -hmm. that also took me to the EU, because it's not a natural. You know, it's uh, it's been described as leaderless pluralism, meaning that it's not clear who's in charge. Uh, and that perhaps will come to that is part of its current difficulties. I think. But I was drawn to this rather unusual uh, experiment in international cooperation, yeah. So I think the three of us go back quite a few years in terms of our associations with UACs. Um, I was just wondering how you got involved in the first instance in, in UACs as an organisation. I Well, my involvement with UACs has been in two sort of phases, really. Um, the first phase was when I stood to and um, was elected on onto the committee and it's funny how these things sort of fade into the memory so i know it, i know it must have been uh, so that was in the mid 90s mid to mid to late 90s and maybe we'll come on to the 50th anniversary project that i've sort of piloted at, at uacs and as part of that i went through the archives <laughs> and i i got to the papers where oh and helen drake said this and, 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 it, and it it really helped to jog my memory mike smith um, a former loughborough um, colleague 
um, he he was in the chair at the time, and then Stephen George took over. Over, and I also I've moved houses a few times recently, and I've been sorting through my stuff. And I also found a little card from in, George, in Stephen George's handwriting that was attached to some flowers, saying "Thank you, Helen, for your your input into the conference." And I'd almost I sort of forgotten, but I think that was the Leicester conference um, in the late nineties, the Leicester Annual Conference. So there was that committee phase, and then I stood down from the committee. And then in 2012, um, I don't know, I, I, so it was January 2012, I guess I was looking for something else to, 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 to think about, to do, um, and the chance came up to stand for chair. Um, as you know, Nick, so the, 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 the window of nominations is in January, so that was January 2012. Unlike you, Nick, I was unopposed, there was no election, and, um, and therefore I became chair in, I, I started in September 2012, and that's, that's kept me, and I've done, I will have done six years by the time of the Bath Conference in a couple of months' time. Excellent. Um, so you've been at... Um a two-term chair, a two-term president yes. for, for six years. What would be some of the highlights of your six years in the post? Um, I think the the um, the project that I just mentioned just now, the 50th anniversary project, is one of the highlights. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, I mean, we got EU funding for it. It brought a lot of us together, the office, the officers, the committee, hopefully the membership. Um, it's. I, I feel quite pleased that I managed to come up with an idea, as I say, that we got funded, but which resulted, amongst other things, in um, 50 years' worth of archives of papers now being safely stored in the historical archives of the EU in uh, in Florence, in Fiesole, in, in, in uh, the EUI in Florence, the European University Institute. Um, the annual conferences, also, I would highlight, uh, we get... We get almost exclusively, I think, good feedback about how friendly they are, how well organised they are. And pe often people write to me, so oh, could you do this for me at the conference? And I say, it's nothing to do with me, as in the office um, and other and officers in the committee. It's really a very much a collective effort. But it's so gratifying that, to know that, well, that people, uh, delegates and speakers, I think, uh, have... Um, overwhelmingly a good experience at the conferences and we go to nice places sure. um, and I'm also I suppose you asked me highlights but I, I, I'm also proud in a way of the fact that um, over the last six years internally the organization um, I, it, it's had some uh, some significant challenges and we're still here so it, it's that's that's a highlight as well really that 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 by pulling together and with the right, you know, with an amount of luck, you, you can just about get over things that might seem quite threatening, yeah. So what has impressed me the most, Helen, and many others in UACs and elsewhere, is just how well you deal with people. So can you just give us a sense of how important that skill is of dealing with people among all your many skills as an academic? It's probably the most, it probably is the most important, uh, mm. or that's how it feels like to me, in that... I mean, alongside being organised, uh, paying attention to detail, which I'm not, that's not necessarily my forte and so on, but, but it is important. And that, I think, for one, one main reason, which is um, I, I don't really ever feel that um, doing something solo is, it, it would achieve the best effect. So it's, it, it, to me, it's important because, A, it's more pleasurable, to work with others, um, and B, it's a way of mobilising everybody's strengths. And I'm, and I think I'm trans, trying to transfer some of those skills into my current job. Uh, so if you hit a buffer or a big problem, I think it's actually quite useful or helpful to externalise that, to bring other people in, to bring ideas in. And and I think, and I mean sometimes it's a bit lonely because sometimes you have to take a decision. Um, yeah, which, which might not have had a consensus and so on, or, or but but as a rule, um, mobilising others to do what they're best at or to do what they're good at and hopefully to do what they want to do, it builds a sort of a strength, I think, into into the decision. And we have had some challenges at UACs, and there's no way that I could have done that, you know, taken actions without 
others' willingness. So I suppose it's it's setting up the, um, an environment where people are more likely to help you than not, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's been one very important external challenge for every one of us, especially in races, and that is the pivotal moment of the EU referendum, the Brexit referendum in the UK. Do you have any thoughts about the role of academics, of experts, if not UACs, in the run-up to the referendum and the actual referendum? Yeah, I mean, this is a work in progress, as in thinking about it, but also the, the way in which us as academics in UACs but also us as academics and so, and experts in our daily lives, the way in which we um, define what's I suppose we, you know what's called public engagement, the way that we define and, and fulfil the role of public engagement is just it, it's a work in it is a work in progress. There's no formula, um, and I think as you know um, the the referendum, the lead up, the result, the aftermath. That has sorely tested um, those of us who study European studies. Why? I mean, it's brought our emotions into play, um, and yet we are, our expertise, our credibility is based on our ability to be impartial, to be, to bring evidence to bear, and so on. Um, I think we've, we've struggled perhaps, um, maybe not so much UACs as an organisation, but individually. Um, because expert has almost rhymed with remainer, um, mm-hmm. and at the uh, and and yet to be an expert means to keep an open mind and to try to uh, give people expertise, as I say, based on evidence. The difficulty has been when there is scant evidence mm-hmm. for so good for arguments that perhaps we don't favour anyway. Mm-hmm. We're in a difficult position, uh, so. I personally, I mean, at UACs, we were not partisan. We don't take sides. So I issued a message really of support and encouragement to our members um, at the time of the referendum. Uh, I think we've encouraged um, on the committee at the conferences open discussion about whether academics have a role as activists. So I think we've tried to, I hope, but it very much to finding our way as we go, have tried to encourage us all to to keep us to keep the space open for those of us to, to have a conversation about what it means to be an expert what it means to be engaged and those who feel that UACs and so and members should have done more before the referendum I think it's okay to say that um, and to, to air it all um, and in the end however our credibility as experts really does rest on our being able to bring evidence to bear and try to um, maintain an open mind. So in light of the result of the referendum, yeah. how do you think UACs will evolve in the next few years? Oh, that's one for Nick, isn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, UACs is a UK-based institution, as you know, it's incorporated legally and so on in, in the UK. How, and it has, a, let's say, around a 1,000 members. Over half of those, um, in terms of nationality, are non-British, and but most of the 100% are European, EU citizens. Many UACs members are based in institutions that are not in the UK, and most academics move and are mobile anyway. Um, uh, yeah, so the membership is very is very European anyway. So that that I think that sort of that is a strength, um, but it is the fact that one of our income streams is uh, European Union grant funding. I talked about the archives project. So there's some there's a challenge perhaps to come about our eligibility as an association once the UK is left to apply for that for that sort of funding. Um, the um, I mean, there has been some talk, and I think you know you, you're probably going to keep it on the agenda, maybe as a standing item, about whether the association should try to have a sort of another foot foot in a in an EU country. I, I, but those are you know those are sort of possibilities, but they're sort of logistical in a way. I think I'll end that question or that answer by reminding us that. 
the and this was one of the benefits I, f- I found it really helpful as chair actually to have done the 15 year project yeah. and have looked through the archives because the UACs began before the, the UK joined the, the European Union it joined it, it, it began precisely after the two failed attempts by the UK to join in the 60s whereby a number of academics felt alarmed that that their fellow uh, that, that other mem- that other countries were joining together and the UK was on the outside so the the, 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 the beginning of the origins of UACs was to uh, to educate to share information to share expertise to help to um, have a conversation about what membership meant so I suppose there's a, a sort of irony in that having gone through the 50 years and celebrated it, it it's now it's now about adjusting to being a non-member state and I, I, I definitely see a future for UACs. I, I suspect we're having a, a boom in European, again it's ironic, but a boom in EU studies perhaps. Uh, maybe the humanities will even come back in. Uh, you know, the Foreign Office is starting to think about, isn't it, the skills it needs in terms of people who understand Europe. So it's not all, it's not all over, um, is what I would say. So related to that, how do you think the study of the EU and the study of Europe has changed and evolved since you became uh, you know, interested in this kind yeah. of discipline and since you became chair of UACs? I mean, from my perspective, when I started to research um, things like Euroscepticism and yeah. Simon Usherwood 15, nearly 20 years ago, we were very much on the fringes of the yeah. discipline, but now we seem to be much more mm-hmm. mainstream given yes. what, we, uh, what we study. So that would be my observation on yeah. that, but I wonder what you felt about that. Well, I, th- I think I'd make the distinction between European studies, which is where I come from, uh, which is where we had the opportunity to study uh, to an advanced level foreign languages and other European countries in some depth through that language. Um, and, and, and from that perspective, studying the European Union was um, just one aspect of that. And I think we've moved very much to a situation where most if UACs members um, are involved in EU studies. So the EU, the European Union itself, in particular for those academics in politics and international relations, has become um, an object of study in its own right, whether it's looking at policy making, whether it's looking at how uh, nation states have adapted sort of Europeanisation. And also there's a, 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 um, a significant amount of research that goes on to looking at how the European Union um, acts as a as an international presence uh, because it's a state but it, it's not a state sorry it's not a state but it has state-like functions so um, that's that's the change I would say uh, and and in some ways that's very good because it, it has opened up the EU to people who don't have a linguistic necessarily a lingu- linguistic ability in foreign languages um, and the discipline, the study of the EU has has evolved as well. It was very much the the the, um, uh, the object of, of international relations scholars, and as you know, some of the first scholars of the EU were were American, were from the United States, looking from the outside in at this example of regional integration, and that's still that's still a very I think rich body of work. Um, that comes to bear on the EU, looking at the EU as a region as any other, where its um, component states have chosen to come together. So, yeah, that, that, that from European studies, um, from an interdisciplinary perspective, to perhaps a more politics IR, for international relations focused uh, on the EU itself. Many of the names you've mentioned, both as your predecessors as president and and colleagues, have been men. Do you want to give us a sense of, you know, has the issue of gender been positive? How has it affected both your role in UACs and your role as an academic? I think I'll start sort of from from now, really, and which is to say I'm delighted that there are so many of my academic colleagues and um, in, in, in UACs, in our discipline, but outside, who are really paying attention to this. So there's some great work going on at Surrey, for example, looking at 
Brexit as a set of gender negotiations. I just talked to the press last week of, and they accused me of academic claptrap actually on Twitter, which was nice. Um, I was talking of the summit as a um, and drawing on the work of, of my colleagues um, as a gendered space uh, and sort of with masculine projections of power and so on. So I think it, it is, um, and that's without talking about the Me Too movement, I, I, I welcome the attention paid to these matters uh, and to the willingness amongst academia for, uh, to, to, to stand up and, and, and speak out and, and in many respects attract unwelcome attention for, for suggesting that, that there is unconscious bias and that, that, that things are structured in a way that uh, discriminates perhaps you know, in many respects against, against women. I've probably been quite lucky um, in that, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've managed to get where I am <laughs> almost, you know, uh, despite being in a minority, there are still issues, and I'm not I'm not specifying any particular university here, but the gender pay gap is uh, most pronounced at the senior level, professorial level, uh, um, in favour of men. But I again, I come back to the positive point, which is I welcome the fact that we're talking about it. It's it's open. It, 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 it can be a problem. I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to remember the Fast Show and the, and the, um, the, uh, the sketch where a woman comes up with a suggestion and the suggestion is not taken up until a man in the group has actually uh, echoed that suggestion. There are occasions when I feel perhaps there's some less audibility, audibility visibility as a woman. And actually, now I'm, on the, now I'm thinking about it, there is research that suggests that student feedback so when we ask our undergraduates in particular to give feedback on their module experience on their experience, there is unfortunately strong evidence to suggest um and i'm really onto a losing ticket here because that the older you are and the and if you're a woman um you are less likely to attract the highest scores and this is to do with stereotypical expectations of male academics and female academics on the other hand um, and that I think that that's I'm slightly off t- off the question here but for me when it comes to what we ask students to tell us about ourselves I think that's one area in which we really need to be very scrupulous about how we use student feedback um, and, uh, and, and, and try to be much more creative about about that that information. So Alan, I have the privilege of working with you on an ESRC funded project on Brexit, the 28 plus perspectives. So I was hoping that you could just tell us a little bit more about the project, please. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, The ESRC is the Economic and Social Research Council, one of the funding councils, and it's got a program which is, they call it Brexit Priority Grants. And I've got one of the, I think, 25 or 26 of those grants. And um, they started up a, um, a year ago, and we've just got an extension, actually, given that Brexit negotiations are not they haven't gone on as smoothly or as fast as might have been expected. So we run to the end of March next year. Um, our project then, 28 plus, the idea there is so 28 is the, are the 28 member states um, and the plus refers to the institutions of the EU who are which are part and parcel of the negotiations. And we're one of two projects, so there's 25 and there's one, there's us and another, that are looking at Brexit from the outside, from the perspective of other member states. Um, so of the 28 member states, we're particularly interested in those that held elections last year in 2017. So that's the Netherlands, France, Germany and Italy, where populist parties, um, in particular on the far right, radical right parties, were sort of knocking at the door, um, putting pressure on mainstream parties and so on. And we were interested to know the extent to which Brexit plays in or play, doesn't play into to that dynamic. And, and we're still doing conducting that original research. Um, so that's one strand, really. Another strand, the plus, is to look at how those Brussels institutions, including the European Parliament, how they are playing in to the negotiations, whether it's Commission or Parliament. And in particular, uh, looking at sort of roles of the role of perhaps values and even emotions in the negotiations more generally, but also 
For example, how is it that the EU, through the institutions for now, has managed to stay quite so united? Mm. Um, uh, so that that's another strand. And then, finally, we, we set about... Um, developing a way of a, a, a method if you like of, of trying to reach and engage with um, stakeholders in the UK who I think increasingly probably do want to know what the EU is thinking and feeling and what the other member states are and we almost sort of by luck stumbled on a method for that which we're put into the test which is we're calling it the Brexit cafe and this is based on um, the world cafe method for quote conversations that matter uh, where you bring people together, ideally facilitated, in what the facilitator I'm working with is called Creative Chaos. You set up a cafe atmosphere, you bring people together from all uh, slices, walks of life, but in particular those perhaps who would be expected to have a, a direct stake in Brexit, so those running companies and so on. Um, and they sit together with people that they don't know and, and uh, they have canapes, maybe a glass of wine, and through carefully constructed questions, um, we, 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 we generate and facilitate a conversation. And so that's the third kind of, if you like, that's how dimension of the project, how we try to reach people with our, with our research. Um, and yeah, so it, it, I mean, the other thing perhaps I could just say is that um, the project that I put together involves five co, what are called co-investigators, so five researchers, four of us we were originally all at Loughborough, one's moved to Queen Mary. We're across four different schools at Loughborough. I think that makes it interdisciplinary. It's multi, it, it's multi uh, generational um, and it's, uh, it's gender balanced. Um, bureaucratically, it, 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 it pushes at the boundaries of the internal system. You can imagine sort of sorting finances out between four schools in the university and another university. Then we've got an outer ring of consultants, and of which you're one, and that's been invaluable to have this outside expertise. Um, and we've got a, a couple of partner institutions as well in the Netherlands and, and in France. So um, I'm learning a lot about project management, and it's 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 it, it, we're on track. Yeah. Sounds great. Sounds fascinating. Um, here's a slightly tricky one then. Um, <laughs> as a renowned expert in the field, what do you see as the you know the main challenges for the European Union moving forward? Not necessarily Brexit, but some of the kind of yeah. the bigger issues that need resolving. I mean, there are all the issues, aren't there? But I think there's at the core of it is the question of governance and mm -hmm. governability. Yeah. And I find myself these days wondering whether we, I don't know whether I mean in the UK or, or, or we in this, uh, uh, in, in the EU or, or further afield at this sort of, us citizens at this time in point in time, uh, there's a sort of air of ungovernability. Um, the, the, the sort of leadership qualities that we talked about Jacques Delors earlier, didn't we? That you, that you want, that, that you hope for in, in politics. Um, they're quite hard to activate, I think. Um, the EU has a sort of a leadership problem anyway because of its unique constellation of uh, sovereign member states, sovereign countries, plus some institutions that each have leaders. So um, structurally that's hard. But I think, I think, so I think leadership is, is, a, is problematic. You know, we, we need some sort of direction, some sort of vision um, to, 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 to counter the challenges that you probably hoped that I was going to enum enumerate. Um, but I suppose that, that you know, if, if, if we were to be cut off now, I would say that, that, that really is at the heart of it. How, how do we all pull together with courage and vision and so on to, 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 to reach collective decisions in which as many people are involved or feel involved as possible? How do we overcome cynicism? How do we overcome senses of political alienation? Um, how do we overcome fake news and so on? So the EU is facing those more generic issues, perhaps. But then, of course, there are uh, more specific ones that, 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 along with those governance issues, could point to disintegration. Um, uh, the sort of the the, 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 under the pressure of the movement of people, for example, and not just the freedom of movement, but but migration or would-be migrants into into the EU, the, the inability 
of the member states at the moment to to show leadership, to, to show to be able to take courageous, bold leaps um, as a way of pulling together to deal with these things, to, to put them in the, the bigger picture, to deal in a humanitarian way with this. The, the, that, that strikes me as very uncom- a very uncomfortable place to be. Um, so I think I'll, perhaps I'll just leave it there um, for now. That's great. But one final question. Um, <laughs> I remember tweeting when I found out that I'd been elected chair um, that you would be a very difficult act to follow, uh-huh. uh, and that's certainly going to be the case. And I just wondered what advice you might have to me as the new chair of UACs from September. Oh. Um, you'll be great. And my <laughs> advice, really, my t- sort of overall advice, is to enjoy it. And I mean that. Be- I think one of the things that I've been able to um, benefit from in, in the chair is leadership, but without too much of the management um, tasks that you know only too well about being head of school at uh, head of department, head of school at, at Bath. You know, you have an executive director, you have uh, an office team, and they take on they take so much of the strain. So you, that gives you some space, uh, room, headspace, if you like, to think to think about the bigger picture, to, to think strategically. Um, and that that's a really nice position to be in. I mean, you know, you might uh, on occasions have to, there is management as well, but it, it, it it's an unusual, I think, position to be in. And then hopefully then you can enjoy it uh, because of that. And, and you'll be working with great people in an association where, as I said earlier, we do get quite good feedback about sure. the, the quality of the conferences of the work of the work that we do so yeah enjoy it and then um as long as you do sort of keep everyone on board and work with everybody then trust your judgment and i suppose that involves trusting the others that you work with and making them feel uh, feel as sort of empowered uh, as you can and uh but yeah enjoy it and i wish you all the very very best um yeah good luck Thank you, Helen. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to be interviewed by myself and Adam. Thank you very much. Adam. Thank you both. And um, well, we look forward to seeing you both at the uh, UACs conference in Bath, which is in September. And thanks for everybody who's listened. Thank you. Mm-hmm.